it gives me immense pleasure to welcome the guest of the day, Mr. J. Sai Deepak, my faculty colleagues and dear students. I welcome you to the third institute lecture of this semester. And as the tradition and custom of our institute dictates, let me request our guest, Mr. J. Sai Deepak, to honor the founder of our institute, Madan Mohan Malviya, by garlanding his bust. Our guest, Mr. J. Sai Deepak, is not a stranger to those who have been following him in the social media, but for the benefit of those who are seeing him for the first time, may I now uh, formally introduce him to the gathering. Mr. J. Sai Deepak is an engineer turned law firm partner turned arguing counsel. Mr. Deepak has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Anna University and a bachelor's degree in law from IIT Kharagpur. Mr. Deepak has been a litigator since July 2009 and was an associate partner at a leading national capital region based litigation firm Sai Krishna and Associates until he went independent in June 2016. In June 2016, Mr. Deepak founded Law Chambers, law chambers of J. Sai Deepak and set up practice as an arguing counsel. Apart from the clients who have retained Mr. Deepak, he is engaged by soliciting law firms and individual solicitors to appear before the Supreme Court of India, the Delhi High Court, the Bombay High Court, the Madras High Court, the Competition Commission of India, the Competition Appellate Tribunal, the Intellectual Property Appellate Board and Tax Tribunals. Mr. Deepak has a full-time full three-member team of associates to handle clients who have retained his chambers and to assist him in matters where he is engaged as arguing counsel. Among the various prominent hallmark cases that Mr. Deepak has been involved, a few of them are worth mentioning. In 2011, Mr. Deepak was the part of a team which represented Greenpeace in Tata Sons versus Greenpeace 2011 and played a vital role in the outcome where the Delhi High Court laid down the law on the interplay between constitutional freedoms and IP rights. Since March 2013, Mr. Deepak has been representing prominent Indian and Chinese mobile phone brands such as Intex and Jayoni against Ericsson in the ongoing standard essential patent litigation before the Delhi High Court, the Intellectual Property Appellate Board and the Competition Commission of India wherein issues relating to the interplay between intellectual property rights and competition law arise for consideration. Since 2011, Mr. Deepak has been, has represented Basmati rice farmers from the state of Madhya Pradesh in the ongoing Basmati geographical indication litigation before the Madras High Court, the Delhi High Court, the IPAB and the geographical indica indications registry. As a consequence of size successful representation of Basmati farmers before the GI registry in December 2013, Mr. Deepak was appointed as the counsel for the state government of Madhya Pradesh in July 2016 to represent it in the ongoing second round of the proceedings in the case before the Madras High Court, the Delhi High Court and the Geographical Indicator Registry. Since November 2016, Mr. Deepak has uh, been engaged by the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotions, Ministry of Commerce, Government of India as an honorary advisor on the implementation of national IPR policy. Uh, Sai came in, uh, the national media talk took major prominence of Mr. Deepak's argument in the Sabarimala temple entry case, which has gained a uh, lot of prominence across the nation in the media. He is an avid legal commentator and has articles to his credit in reputed international journals such as Max Planck Institute's International Review of Intellectual Property Law and Competition Law and national journals such as the Indian Journal of Intellectual Property Law and Journal of Intellectual Property Rights. He has won several national as well as international accolades uh, pertaining to legal writing competitions such as the 2008 Legal Writing Competition of the International Association for the advancement of teaching and research in intellectual property. He has been invited in the past to present his views on important legal developments on, by platforms in India and abroad. With this uh, few words of introduction, may I now request our speaker, our guest, 
Mr. J. Sai Deepak to address us today on the topic, the Right to Education Act. Mr. J. Sai Deepak. Good evening. So, I am told about 400 students registered for today's, uh, let's call it the drone attack. Uh, how many students do we have from the law school here, from the law program here? Okay, not bad. But uh, given that there is a disproportionate representation from the non-legal fraternity, I'll try to keep this as, as simple and as non-legal as possible. Because I want the audience to understand the topic as opposed to showing off what I know or what I don't know. So let me try and uh, keep this as interactive as possible. I was told that I have about 45 minutes to speak and about 15 or 20 minutes of interaction at the end of the discussion. But uh, should anyone have any questions to ask during the course of my talk, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll take your question. Just give me your background and uh, so that I understand what is the context of the question and what is the sandarbh of the question, okay? And uh, rest assured, according to me, the one thing that the legal profession teaches is that no question is dumb and every question has its own meaning, has its own value. So feel free to throw whatever you think you can. But uh, just make sure that you're clear in what you're asking so that I have a clear picture of what to respond to. Now, how many of you have heard of the Right to Education Act? Okay. Why have you come for this lecture? Just don't tell me that you're being given any additional credits for this. Is there any other reason? Is that, does the topic interest you at all in the first place? How many of you are interested in understanding the Right to Education Act? A raise of hands, please. Yes. Okay. Does it affect you as engineering students at all? How does it affect you as engineering students? Does the act apply to engineering institutions or does it apply only to schools? Simple question. Does the act apply to schools or does it apply equally to professional degrees? How many people think it applies to both? Show of hands, please. Okay. How many people think that it applies only to schools? Okay. So I think the second option is the correct option. I can't lock it, but the, fra the fact of the matter is there is a serious amount of, uh, I'd say, confusion among a lot of educated people as to what is this act about and wh why does it create so much of controversy and confusion between people's minds. So there are hundreds of issues that have to be dealt with under, under this particular issue, but I will try to limit it to a couple of three or four sub-issues so that the big picture consequence of this legislation and it's the problem that it creates when it comes to the Indian education system uh, becomes clear to the audience. So let me try and do a few things which are relatively simple. One, how many of you understand the concept of fundamental rights? You understand the concept of fundamental rights. Okay, good. Lawyers struggle with it. You understand it. I'm happy. Okay. So, uh, as it stands today, do you think that the right to education is a fundamental right? Has the law recognized it? Okay. When do you think it was recognized as a fundamental right? Give me a tentative figure. 80s, 90s, 70s, 60s, 2000s. When was it recognized? 2002. Right? So what does it mean when someone says that a certain right is a fundamental right? Feel free to volunteer with answers. What is the meaning of a fundamental right? So if right is the noun and fundamental is the adjective, how does the adjective inform the noun or influence the noun? What makes a right fundamental? This is English, it's not law. So I'm sure with at least 16 years of English education, you must be able to answer the question of what is it that an adjective does to a noun. So what is it about a fundamental right that makes it so important? Yes, please, proceed. Okay. Fair enough, that's a good answer. Now, does it mean that these rights are absolute and there can be no restrictions that can be put on these rights? If according to you, a fundamental right is a right that you recognize in a certain human being by virtue of him being a human being or her being a human being and therefore it is inalienable, can there be limitations on those rights? Can there be restrictions on those rights? Is it possible? Yes or no? Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. 
how can you impose restrictions on fundamental rights? Is it not at loggerheads with each other? When you say that restrictions can be imposed on something which is a fundamental right, a right which is so fundamental, then are you not speaking from both sides of your mouth? Are you not saying two things which are contradictory? How do you justify the existence of, let's say, limitations on fundamental rights? Sir, for the coexistence of the fundamental rights of all the individuals, hmm. we need to explain the fundamental rights of one individual where, where the coexistence can be. So think of it as a traffic signal which is meant to regulate the traffic while each of you has the right to drive and the right of locomotion. It means that your, your right has to equally accommodate someone else's right and to, prefect, uh, to prevent what is called a logjam, so to speak, you decide to have a regulatory system and that regulation is recognized, as simple as that, right? So one, I go with your answer that a fundamental right is fundamental because you deem it to be present in a human being as a consequence of him or her being a human being, right? Now, does the constitution grant you fundamental rights or does it recognize that you have fundamental rights? It recognizes. What is the difference? When you say that something is granted by the constitution or when you say that something is recognized by the constitution, do you know what the difference so, in which case, a right which flows directly from the constitution, which is if the sroth of that particular right happens to be the constitution, then it would be a constitutional right. But if the right is recognized by the constitution as pre existing, then it becomes a fundamental right. Now, in which case, is there any provision of the constitution which says these are the list of fundamental rights that you shall enjoy by virtue of you being a human being? Use your knowledge of civics you, which you must have studied as part of your school's uh, curricula. Have you come across or have you heard any particular provision which says one, two, three, four, these are the exhaustive rights that you enjoy as fundamental rights? Part, 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 part of the Indian constitution. constitution. Part 3 of the constitution deals with fundamental rights, but does it enumerate fundamental rights? Does it? How? What are the rights which are recognized? So these rights which are not mentioned in the constitution but are now treated as fundamental, where did they come from? Okay. So, would that mean that the judiciary is the source of certain fundamental rights which are not recognized in the constitution? Yes, interpreted them. The reason why I am doing this particular exercise is that I can come out and give you gyan with a lot of preachy material. I am trying to see how much you know so that I can connect the dots from what you know. Okay. So, please take part in this. Backbenchers, I have been a backbencher and I'm, I have a pretty sharp eye. I have been a backbencher all through my academics. So, I am going to come out to the backbenchers. Please remember that. Okay. Please. Yes, go ahead. So, how is the judiciary the source of these fundamental rights? What gives it the power to interpret the constitution to say that while some of these rights are not expressly mentioned in the constitution, we believe that the constitution recognizes them. How does this happen? Rights should be for a human being or not. When it comes to the judiciary, like right to education, it should be for a human being. That is why it has interpreted that under Article 21, it is given that when you interpret Article 21, you get to know these are rights in the Article 21 itself, which is not explicitly provided, but they are inbuilt in it. So, what this tells you, yes, please, go ahead. The inherent power of judicial review, the inherent no. power of judicial review. Huh. Now here's the thing. Under Articles 32 or 226, which your colleague refers to, and rightly so, it gives you the right to approach these courts to say. My fundamental rights have been violated as a consequence of some action of the state. 
So when you go there, you cannot file that action unless and until there is a pre-existing right which has been violated by the state. And judicial review would mean, review, review, you are effectively taking a look at state action to decide whether that action is within the four corners of the constitution or is it in at loggerheads with the constitution. So can the power of judicial review give rise to a process where new fundamental rights are recognized? You get the question? If the judiciary is creating certain fundamental rights or is recognizing certain fundamental rights out of the umbrella of rights which are recognized by the constitution, how do you approach the Supreme Court for enforcement of certain rights which the Supreme Court is yet to recognize? Yes, please. It's like someone is throwing me out of my shelter. Right. So I can go to the Supreme Court and say that I have a right to life. Right. And hence, I have a right to shelter. Right. So it's upon the Supreme Court to pronounce whether right to shelter is a part of the right to life. Good. So this is the essential part. So just understand this. One. The legislature has the power to effectively create new sets of rights through legislations or it has the power to recognize new sets of rights. But the judiciary is not an academic body. Which means the Supreme Court is not uh, in the business of giving out opinions without there being a case in front of it. So it's not as if you can suddenly write to the Supreme Court like you write to a lawyer, please tell me if I have a right on something. So a good set of these rights, at least 15 to 17 rights have been created by the Supreme Court as a consequence of, as, as your friend rightly points out, somebody going to the Supreme Court and saying that as part of the umbrella of rights, there are certain sub rights which are incidental to these rights. And therefore, if you stop X, you're effectively stopping Y. Y is recognized in the constitution, X flows from Y. You get the point? So there is a, let's use a Boolean algebra here for a moment. You have a super set of rights which have been specifically captured and recognized in the constitution. I continue to use the word recognized and not granted. Remember, okay? Out of these super sets, how many subsets can be created can happen in two different ways. One through the parliament, which can do it proactively, either for a political incentive or if there is public pressure, or as a consequence of any international instrument, because you have entered into a certain treaty. The second option would be for the judiciary to create those rights by recognizing those rights. So here is a situation where creation is a consequence of recognition. Look at the paradox here. You are creating it as existing already and thereby you are giving it certain life. Okay. Now that means it effectively requires somebody to approach the court in a given case to say, I believe that I enjoy this sub right which is a part of or which flows from a super right, so to speak. Okay. Now, so what have we established from these questions and answers? One, there is a distinction between a fundamental right and a constitutional right. Two, that a fundamental right is not created by the constitution but is recognized by the constitution by virtue of you being human beings. That is a rebuttable presumption but a presumption nevertheless. Okay. Three, that the judiciary has the power to recognize more rights which form part of existing rights. Four, that the judiciary does not render academic opinions, but it does so when a certain issue is escalated before it by way of a petition. Right? So there are only two sets of courts which have the power under Indian judiciary to do this. One is the high courts, which is why your colleague mentioned article 226. So the power of the high court to actually grant justice with respect to fundamental rights comes from article 226 and sometimes 227. Whereas the Supreme Court has the power under Article 32. You don't need to get into this beyond that. Forget this for a moment. Now assume for a moment that there is a legislation or an act, let's just call it an act, which was passed in 1970. I, I'll give you a very popular example. So I am now fighting for, and this must be fairly popular for students, uh, decriminalization of ganja. Okay. I am saying that it must be made 
legal or at least it should not be criminal. Now, when did ganja become illegal in this country? Just give me a ballpark figure. When did you when do you think it became illegal in India? 80s, 80s right? 1985. So, ganja was legal until 85, but suddenly it became criminal post 1985, right? Therefore, it continues to be illegal today. Not fully illegal because the state still has the power to prescribe a certain limit for personal consumption. I think in Bengal, it's about 20 to 28 grams. You can consume it legally. Now, if today somebody were to challenge that legislation, the NDPS Act of 1985, which we have before the Delhi High Court, and we say that a legislation that was passed in 1985 is illegal today, and I'm asking the court to recognize a new form of right, then effectively what is happening? A pre-existing legislation can be reviewed by the court and create a new right which was not recognized when the act came into existence in 1985. You see how the process works. Why? What is the logic of this? How is this possible? The assumption is as time goes by, certain acts lose value and they are no more relevant because new material has come about to show why that act is wrong. So, for instance, how many people know that cannabis, ganja, marijuana is effectively used for cancer treatment today? Cannabinoids are used for cancer treatment. It is used for pain management. So, the British actually came about with a report called the Indian Drug Hemp Commission report in 1890s, which you should just read, where they wanted to ban ganja, then re they realized that it is so inherent to the spiritual, medicinal and cultural practices of India that they said it's best left untouched. But an Indian government decides to ban it in 1985. That's, a, that's an interesting point. Okay. Why is all of this relevant? So an existing legislation and an old legislation can be challenged and it can be struck down to give rise to new rights which did not exist when the legislation was passed. Understand that. Okay. That is the nature of a fundamental right. Which means you have the option of challenging a legislation every few years to see if the circumstances have changed, warranting the reinterpretation of that particular act. 2009, the Delhi High Court holds that homosexuality is legal, or at least Article 377 is unconstitutional. Then the Supreme Court in a constitution bench basically says, I'm sorry, there's a problem with it. The Delhi High Court was wrong and the provision is right. Then in 2018, they come out with a new decision saying that the Delhi High Court was right. So when you think of law, you will have to be slightly more fluid in your thinking because not everything is black and white and it is always a question of the circumstance in which you challenge a certain issue or you raise a certain issue, which is why it is extremely contextual. Today it appears to us that something so fundamental as education should have been recognized as a fundamental right way before 2002, but it was recognized for the very first time as fundamental right in 2002. So now I'll explain what is the consequence and what does this exactly translate to. So I'll give you just a few time, uh, let's say timelines, just bear with me. I'll try and connect everything and I'll try to make sense of it for you. So in 1992, the Supreme Court comes out with a judgment, basically saying, that education is a charitable activity, that there cannot be any kind of business as far as education is concerned. When did India liberalize? 91. Despite that, the Supreme Court comes out with a verdict in 1992 that given the importance of education, it was still approaching education from a socialist standpoint that you cannot do business as far as education is concerned. And that continues to be the verdict of the Supreme Court even in 2014. But do you think that education is not treated as a business anymore? How many of you believe that education has become a business today? Okay. How many of you believe that there is nothing wrong with education being a business today as long as there is quality? 
How many of you believe that education at all levels must be provided free of charge regardless of somebody being good for it or regardless of somebody having the means to acquire it? Okay. Somehow you are in the minority. But in India, minorities have more rights. Oh, okay. So, uh, why is this important? So, between 92 and 2014, over the course of at least 7 to 8 important judgments, the Supreme Court takes different views and I'll tell you how the transition happens. Then I'll connect it to the RTE Act because the RTE Act is the consequence of these judgments. So just bear with me. In the 90s, the Supreme Court comes out with the following points of view. Yeah. One, there is no fundamental right to establish an educational institution because according to the Supreme Court, Running an educational institution is neither a business, nor a trade, nor an occupation, nor a profession. These are the only four words to the best of my memory that are used in Article 19. So people who were running educational institution were asking the Supreme Court, it's not trade, it's not profession, it's not business, it is not occupation. What is it? The Supreme Court said it's a dharamshala. Okay. Because what you're effectively doing is charity. So, they ended up asking, please tell me, on the basis of which provision have you come out with this particular interpretation? Because there are only four words recognized in the constitution to, let's say, define or to describe any field of human enterprise. Profession, business, trade or occupation. If you have not this, where is this? Where is this? So, the Supreme Court started off by saying, we don't wish to answer the question of whether it falls under one of these four categories or whether it falls under any of these categories. We will only come to the limited conclusion that it is some activity that does not attract any of these four definitions. These judgments make for very interesting reading in fact. You should read them because there is a lot of humorous value according to me. Because it is humorous today, but in 1992 this was taken extremely seriously. Because that was a time when you were still reeling under the devastating impact of what I call Nehruvian Socialism. Because any kind of profit making activity was frowned upon, particularly with respect to education, was even more frowned upon. So the Supreme Court takes this view. So they end up asking, so does it mean I don't have the right to establish an educational institution? No, you have the right to establish an educational institution. But it is not a fundamental right. Now here is the thing. The Supreme Court interprets in the same set of judgments that no, no, as far as education is concerned, it is of paramount importance. Every person must have the right to be educated. And then it gradually pushes to a point where it says that right to life includes the right to receive education. Now here is the point. Ice cream khana in ke liye ek fundamental right hai. You have the fundamental right to consume, but if you do not have the fundamental right to make, what will you consume? Air. So the funny part was, the Supreme Court was recognizing the right to consume education or to be educated or to receive education at a fairly faster pace than recognizing the right to establish an educational institution. Do you see the difference? So you have created the consumer, you have also recognized the fundamental right of the consumer to receive and consume, but the right of the maker to produce is something that is not treated as fundamental until 2002, over the course of at least six major judgments. Because the Supreme Court continues to pontificate, no, no, no. India has always treated education as so pure and as so fundamental that commerce has never been a part of this particular punya activity and therefore we do not want anybody to commercialize education. After these judgments I find education vastly more commercialized than it was in 1992. That seems to be the paradox of course. Now what happens as a consequence of this? The Supreme Court recognizes that there are three levels of education. Primary, Secondary, tertiary. Primary, I assume, is almost until the sixth standard. Then from sixth to tenth, you have the second. 
Uh, and then of course, uh, I'm so sorry, the secondary education would be your undergraduation courses and tertiary education is post-graduation. The Supreme Court realized that here was an instance where investment into secondary education and higher education, rather tertiary education was vastly more than investment in primary education. And therefore you were catering to the interests of people who have the money to pay for secondary education and for tertiary education, but you have not catered to the interests of the poor people who cannot afford even schools. So that discussion starts parallelly. So then the Supreme Court says, there are certain provisions of the constitution which effectively require the government of India to provide compulsory education until the age of 14. Okay. It does not say from which age, it says until the age of 14. So effectively, from the age of 5 to 14, largely speaking, when the education starts, or maybe even from 4, 4 to 14, the constitution says that it has to be free, it has to be universal, and it is mandatory, it is compulsory. Now when they start doing this, the one thing that the Supreme Court realizes is, the constitution is casting this obligation on whom? The state, on the government. So here is the big brother, the government. The constitution casts certain obligations on the big brother to do certain activities, which is to ensure that there is mandatory, compulsory, universal, elementary education until the age of 14, free of charge. Now under the Right to Education Act, I'm just jumping here for a moment. Has the government taken the responsibility or has it put this responsibility on the private entity? The constitution speaks of casting a duty on the state to educate everyone. So that means at best that particular obligation will apply to government run schools or government aided schools. Right? When did this become legitimate for this obligation to apply to non-government aided private institutions? So which means if the government is not able to provide housing by let's say another 5 or 6 years, it will cast the obligation on companies to actually use certain portion of their profits to construct houses for everyone. Effectively that is what it is doing with respect to CSR, the corporate social responsibility. What does this mean? I am trying to push towards a certain point which is to say, the state can have any kind of responsibility to educate everyone. Why should a private individual or a private organization have the responsibility or a social responsibility to educate people? That's the first question that I'm going to try and address. Second, if you happen to be an institution which is not a minority institution and you happen to be an institution which is a minority institution, does the constitution allow you to say minority institutions have no obligation to educate anyone whereas majority institutions have the obligation to educate everyone. This is the second issue that I am going to try and address. Three, do you know the number of schools which have been shut down across the country as a consequence of the right to education act? At least in the state of Delhi, at the very least, close to 3000 to 4000 schools have been shut down as a consequence of this act. Why is all of this happening? So let me try and break this down for you. One, in 2005, they decide to come out with this legislation called what? Please tell me, help me with it. The Right to Education Act is brought about in 2010, but before that they do a few things. So the Supreme Court recognizes the right to uh, universal education until the age of 14 and that is inserted in, into the constitution through which provision? 21A. So for the very first time, the Supreme Court recognizes the right to education in 2002 through a judgment which is de delivered by 11 judges of the Supreme Court that translates to a, a specific provision in the constitution by way of article 21A. Now this particular provision kicks into force in 2006, January 2006. When does the RT Act come about? 2009? Right. And it comes into existence in 2010. Now what does the RT Act do? So let me explain what it does. The RT Act effectively says that whether you are a private institution or a government funded institution or a government aided institution, 
all of you shall comply with the requirements of the right to education act but what does it mean that you have to comply with the requirements of the uh, right to education act one minimum facilities for education must be there certain minimum criteria with respect to student teacher ratio must be complied with certain minimum criteria with respect to infrastructure must be complied with all that is perfectly acceptable but what it says is that at least 25 percent of your input as far as class one is concerned must include people from the poor the backward sections and coming from the SCST background these people must be incorporated as part of this particular uh, structure on the face of it frankly speaking it is a very noble gesture and I think it is an important gesture because at the end of the day you are trying to ensure that people are not deprived of access to education merely because they happen to be at a certain at a certain level in the social strata I understand all of that but here is the problem with the implementation the implementation says in each area the government will ask itself what is the average amount that somebody spends on education in that particular area taking into account their socio-economic characteristics and they will arrive at an average figure per student which is to say assume for a moment that there happens to be a school right outside BHU and somebody comes to the conclusion that an average parent spends about 2000 rupees in educating a child who lives in this particular area then the government will compensate the schools which exist in this particular area to the tune of 2000 rupees for those 25 percent students who are supposed to be absorbed by the school now the unfortunate reality of this particular situation is this is an average which means not every school is necessarily going to spend 2000 some may be spending more than 2000 some may be spending less than 2000 the central government and the state government have to share this particular burden of reimbursing the schools how many institutions and how many news reports have you come across where schools have been shut down because they have not been reimbursed by the state government for at least the last three to four years have you not heard of such news reports you know why this happens one because the government is trying to impose a welfareist model a socialist model not taking into account the sheer fluctuation from area to area from parent to parent from school to school with respect to the amount that it spends on students so you are not in a position to come out with an exact figure which can do justice to the amount of expenditure for every school located in a certain radius which means at the end of the day schools end up spending more than what they are supposed to and they get less than what they are supposed to and at the end of the day it happens to be an enterprise whose balance sheet reads in the negative you may not want the school or educational institutions to to be run for profit you may not want commercialization of education but has it affected or so can the school change the reality when it comes to the salaries that it has to pay to teachers it has to employ a significant number of people so you have not fixed a ceiling as far as the salaries of teachers are concerned but you expect the school to operate under a certain budget which means that as far as the school is concerned there is no limitation on its outflow but there is a limitation on its inflow as far as income is concerned now why is all of this relevant I'll, I'll take it to a slightly more controversial issue assume for a moment that this particular burden were to be cast on schools of all hues whether it is minority schools or majority schools then perhaps everybody is equally affected what the government did in 2002 and then in 2010 was to ensure that this particular structure and this particular obligation of educating 25 percent of poor students in your schools applies only to non-minority schools which means nobody who belongs to a majority community or a majority group so to speak has an incentive to set up a school today because there are enhanced obligations on him when it comes to running of his institution and there is no guarantee as far as the reimbursement of the money that he's supposed to get from the government so what does this mean uh, let me be blunt here and make it slightly politically incorrect assume that there is a Hindu there is a Muslim and there is a Christian as far as the Muslim run schools and the Christian run schools are concerned they do not attract RTE if they are private and unaided which means Muslim run schools and Christian run schools have absolute autonomy as far as their admissions are concerned compared to non-muslim schools and non-christian schools 
notwithstanding the fact that they do not receive any funds from the government. That means even if you happen to be a completely unaided institution, the very fact that you are a non-minority institution would mean that the RT applies to you and 25% rule applies to you. So the one question that you have to ask yourself is, if we assume and if we take it for granted that India happens to be a secular country and therefore social obligations apply equally across the board to institutions of all religions regardless of the religious affiliation, what is the logic of saying that the obligation to educate people or students until the age of 14 applies only to institutions of a certain community? Now what does this do? What is the reasoning that the Supreme Court has given and what is the reasoning that is given in popular or in public media is that minority educational institutions are given special treatment under the constitution, that they have a separate protection under the constitution thanks to articles 28 to 30 and this protection is not available to non-minority institutions as a consequence of which it is perfectly constitutional and legal to exempt minority institutions from any kind of social obligation. That is the logic that has been given and somehow the Supreme Court has accepted this logic. Now if you read the provisions of the constitution that deal with minority educational institutions, which are those provisions, students of law, articles 28 to 30, what does the Supreme Court say and what is it that the constitution itself says is, in fact until 2002, until the TMA Pi judgment, the Supreme Court has said, this is the majority, this is the minority. The reason why the constitution has specific provisions for establishment of educational institutions by minority communities is to ensure that they continue to have the right to preserve their cultural identity, their linguistic identity and any other specific aspect of their identity which they wish to protect through education. That simply means while we are more than happy if you were to assimilate as part of the majority community or the majority identity so to speak, should you wish to protect your identity, we are giving you a specific protection under the constitution which ensures that nobody will come in the way of you establishing your own institutions to preserve your identity. Okay, Which simply means that a Muslim will have the right to preserve his identity as a Muslim through institutions which are Muslim in character, through preservation of the Muslim culture, through Muslim institutions. As simple as that. That does not take away the character of the Muslim institution as an Indian institution or as an institution to which Indian laws apply. Therefore, if your logic is that universal education is an obligation on the state and you have decided to delegate that obligation to private institutions, and that is a universal obligation meant to educate people. Why is it that that particular obligation is exclusively reserved for one community and not for other communities? There is no logic as far as that divide is concerned. Most importantly, on one hand, when people argue that you are marginalizing certain minority communities by not giving them enough voice and by not making them part of the mainstream, are you not pushing them away from the mainstream by telling them that obligations which are applicable to every other Indian institution will not be applicable only to the minority institution. So here's the question. What is the population proportion or let's say demographic division in India today? Roughly about 70 to 75 percent Hindu and about 25 percent non-Hindu. Does 25 percent non-Hindu character take away the identity of 75% Hindus. It does not. It does not come in the way of your identity. Their existence does not come in the way of your identity. So if there are 25% students who are introduced in non-minority institutions, so technically speaking only 25% of those students of a minority institution are technically non-minority. Does that interfere with the identity of the minority institution? I am giving you a logic. If 25% of minority population does not take away the identity of the 75% Hindu majority of India, why should 25% of students who come from the poor backgrounds, who come from the SCST backgrounds, why should their entry into minority institutions take away the identity of minority institutions? Most importantly, is there any assumption that 25% students who are absorbed from the economically weaker society are necessarily Hindus or Muslims or Christians, they could come from across the board, 
they could be from any community now in which case there is a decent chance that a good number of them could also be from the Muslim community so here's what happened the government of the day at that point of time and the Supreme Court further said your obligation is to take on board only those people who are poor and who come from your community and nobody else which means minority institutions are allowed to choose which community they can choose from as far as the 25% quota is concerned and they are entitled to limit the application of the quota only to students coming from the minority community. I am asking myself this simple question. While there could be any other issue with respect to the implementation of the RTE, do you believe that the provision which says that there must be separate and special treatment of minority institutions, does it foster national integration or does it create separate identities and strengthen these separate identities? That is the question that you have to ask yourself. If the fundamental object of the Right to Education Act is to ensure that students coming from whichever background in terms of religious background as long as they come from the economically poor backgrounds and weaker sections of the society must get access to basic education. If that is the stated goal and if that is the stated objective of this particular legislation, how does it make sense to say that this particular obligation shall not apply to one particular category of institutions based on their religious identity? The problem that this does at the end of the day, I'll come to you. The problem that this creates at the end of the day is one, any person who comes from a non-minority identity has fewer incentives to set up an educational institution. Just as members of the minority community have 100% rights under the constitution to protect their identity, it is equally the right of non-minorities to preserve their identity and their cultural uh, traits as well as their linguistic traits as well and the religious traits as well. Most importantly, across the world, if the population of a certain group exceeds 10%, it is no more treated as a minority community. You take up the definition of OECD or any other institution, 10% is when you are treated as a minority community or a minority group. Beyond that, you are no more a minority. Most importantly, if you look at articles 28 to 30, they don't speak of only religious minorities, they also speak of linguistic minorities. So, which means, if I happen to represent the Telugu speaking community in the state of Tamil Nadu and my population is decidedly less, I should be equally entitled to call myself a minority institution for the purposes of that state because you don't decide majority and minority on the basis of a pan-India calculation but you do it on the basis of state to state calculation. Which means Kashmiri Hindus would happen to be minorities as far as the state of Jammu and Kashmir is concerned. Hindus would happen to be minorities as far as the state of Meghalaya, Mizoram and Nagaland is concerned. Hindus could perhaps be a potential minority in the state of Kerala in about 20 years. So the point is, each of these institutions, sorry, each of these states will have a different definition of who is a majority and who is a minority. Unfortunately, when you interpret who is a minority, you always arrive at only a religious minority, which means the full scope of articles 28 to 30 of the constitution which speaks of minorities on the basis of language, on the basis of culture, on the basis of religion has been effectively reduced to only one metric. So people who swear by the constitution, who profess love for the constitution, who say we are constitutional patriots and who believe that the constitution is the source of their patriotism must ask themselves, how is it that we have progressively allowed the systematic reduction of the express language of the constitution where the term minority has been reserved only for one criteria which is religious minority and second when your object is to educate everyone until the age of 14 how is it that this particular goal is limited only to non-minority institutions therefore aren't you responsible for alienating the minority communities by telling them that you need not be part of any obligation that applies to everybody else this is point number two. Point number three, whether you like it or not, today to say that education is merely a charitable activity and that it cannot undergo commercialization is rank stupidity for the simple reason, for the simple reason 
that the government alone has proven to be incapable of having either the resources or the wherewithal to provide education at all levels. Most importantly, the difference between a private body and a public body is the speed with which the private body responds to the needs of the industry. It is far more easier to change the curriculum of a private institution to ensure that it is at par with the industry's demands than of an institution that is run by the government. Multiple examples. In such a situation, are you not creating more impediments for investment in private education sector by imposing these kind of, let's call them blatantly socialist and communist obligations, particularly when every other field has been given a completely free hand almost. Going by that logic, every lawyer must effectively have 25% of clients from the economically weaker sections of the society. Every doctor must have an obligation as far as 25% of his patients are concerned. Every architect must build at least 25% of houses for poor people. Are we doing that? But when it comes to such a core sector, which is education, on, and here's how important the education sector is, which is the largest sector by default on which the government spends a significant portion of its GDP, it's the defense sector. After the defense sector, it happens to be the education sector. So by giving such a huge outlay to the education sector, you effectively recognize how important it is for the future of the country. Despite it being the second largest outlay as far as your GDP is concerned and as far as your budget allocation is concerned, you are still falling short on your ability to meet the demands because the population is outpacing your ability to allocate the budget. In which case, when it comes to building of airports today, you are perfectly happy with a public-private partnership. When it comes to the building of roads today, you are perfectly happy with a public-private partnership. But when it comes to education, you want education to be limited to a mere charitable activity. Some might say, oh, perhaps he represents a few money bags who run educational institutions and that is where this point of view is coming from. The fact of the matter is, regardless of who I represent and if at all I represent someone, you are effectively looking at simple question of supply versus demand. If the government is in a position to fulfill 100% of the demand and it is able to meet the entire requirements on the supply side, then there is no need for a private actor at all. But if there is a clear paucity and the government is not in a position to meet the 100% of the demand and you want private players to enter the place, the obligations that are there on you from the constitution don't transfer it to the private party. Then does it mean that there can be no ceiling as far as let's say uh, the uh, ability of private parties to charge fees is concerned? Should there be no regulation at all? Not at all. I am saying there must be regulation. Regulation from the standpoint of quality, regulation from the standpoint of qualification, regulation from the standpoint of ensuring that there is equal representation for merit and that there is some amount of social obligation. But if it means 50% of the seats or more than that are reserved for let's say people who come from the, uh, uh, the poor background and who are not in a position to actually meet uh, let's say the, the requirement of money. Where will the money come from? The money has to come effectively from the rest of the 50%, which means automatically you end up pushing the fees that the other person is going to pay. Now, when you pay for education, let's say in an engineering institution or a medical institution, are you paying only for the cost of your education or are you also paying for the capital investment that somebody has made in the infrastructure that they have built? Let me give you a simple example. I'm a product of IIT, therefore I know for a fact that almost every department of IIT and every course that is offered by IIT is significantly subsidized by the government. Okay? But if there is no subsidy that comes from the government as far as the private institution is concerned, he has to recover the cost of establishing the particular institution. He has to not just recover the cost of establishing that institution, he also has to look at growing that particular institution because as times keep changing and as technology keeps moving, be it biotechnology departments, or medical departments or engineering departments or for that matter even law departments, it is not possible for you to make a one-time investment. It is a recurring investment on, a, on an yearly basis, almost on an annual basis. Where is this money going to come from? So frankly speaking, it would be blatant hypocrisy on the part of our society as well as the government 
if it were to exempt all other fields of human activity from any kind of social obligation, but impose this kind of onerous social obligation exclusively in the education sector. Because when you do that, anybody who has, forget for that moment, I'll give you a simple example. Assume for a moment I have a corpus of 200 crores at the age of 60, which I would like to invest in the education sector as, uh, let's say, as part of my philanthropic activity. The RTE Act does not strike a distinction between anyone who does it for business and who does it for charity. The obligation of 25% applies equally to both parties. Assume for a moment that I am setting up an institution for the purposes of running a charitable educational institution. It makes sense to impose those obligations on me because I am not there to make profit. But if I am there to make profit and also deliver quality education, then imposing this kind of a requirement effectively impedes my interest in entering in that particular sector. So that gentleman has a question and after that I will come to your question. Yes please, you have a question. Right. No, I didn't say that. Go ahead, you finish your point, I'll correct myself. Go ahead, please. Sir, as far as the MFI Foundation judgment is concerned, you said that uh, they have been given so much of freedom that they are basically from majority. Right. And your point was that. Right. But sir, as per Article 30, it is said established and administered. Correct. So they should be given both the rights, why only one right? Right. So this particular provision has been interpreted in two judgments of the Supreme Court. And you can verify this, a 1974 judgment in uh, Ahmedabad St. Xavier's College Society, then the TMAPI judgment. In both these judgments, the Supreme Court asks itself whether minorities are given special rights and more rights. These are two different things. More rights would mean that you end up giving more protection from the law and from the state than is available to non-minority groups. Okay, The reason why it cannot be interpreted in such a fashion is because it would be in violation of article 14. Because the moment you say that everybody has to be treated equally, then to say that majority has X rights and minority has X plus rights would run in the face of article 14. That's one. Second, what the Supreme Court has said after undertaking an analysis of the history of articles 28 to 30 as well as the language is to say, 30 is an express recognition of the very same rights which are available to the majority and which need not be spelt out for the majority because the majority does not need protection from the minority. The minority needs protection to ensure that the majority does not rough, uh, ride roughshod over the rights of the minority. What does it mean? You recognize that there are people who are perhaps 20 to 25 percent of the population and you want to ensure that they continue to have the freedom to retain their identity and to ensure that they have that freedom, you carve out a specific provisions called Article 28 to 30. That means that express recognition is the same as the implicit recognition of the rights of the majority. This is to only ensure that tomorrow nobody says that minorities in this country do not have the right to retain their cultural identity or the linguistic identity or religious identity. That is the limited object of Article 30 and that is what the Supreme Court has said in multiple judgments. So what happened was this. Since the Supreme Court has interpreted Articles 28 to 30 in this fashion, no government could have done anything contrary to these judgments and contrary to Article 14 or contrary to Articles 28 to 30 to give special rights to minorities. Which is why the government of the day in 2009, rather yes, in 2009, came out with an amendment to Article 15 of the Constitution. Article 15 of the Constitution for the very first time was amended to say that as far as the measures introduced through any law is concerned for the betterment of uh, backward classes or for sh uh, scheduled tribes or scheduled classes, those laws shall not apply to uh, private unaided minority institutions. This amendment was made for the very first time in 2009 to ensure that for the very first time the constitution effectively recognizes that as far as minority groups are concerned they have greater rights 
and greater protection from state interference. So one would have expected somebody to challenge this particular provision before the Supreme Court saying how on earth can you actually do something like this because it flies in the face of the basic structure of the constitution. The basic structure of the constitution is that you cannot give special treatment to any group. Special treatment to any group would also mean that you cannot give them special protection from the state. Simple. If all of you are students of a certain class and the teacher of the class has the right to give corporal punishment which is to say that to slap uh, the students of the class, no particular student can be given protection from that particular slap. Either nobody gets slapped or everybody gets slapped as long as the condition applies. But to say that one particular person shall not be slapped because of his religious identity or her religious identity is to actually commit inequality on everybody else. So when this issue was raised before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court then says all the previous judgments which were passed saying the rights of majorities and minorities as far as educational institutions are concerned were judgments which were passed in the absence of the latest constitutional amendment and the latest constitutional amendment is justified because the object is to ensure that everybody gets uh, educated equally. Here's the inconsistency in that argument. One, if the constitution never intended unequal treatment of groups, any amendment to the constitution which results in unequal treatment of groups must be treated as a basic violation of secularism as well as the basic structure of the constitution. Second, if the object is to educate anyone and everyone, then there is no reason to exempt this kind of social obligation on minorities. Because effectively that would mean that you are slowly carving a space for minority identity to such an extent that any social obligation which is meant for the good of everyone is also exempt as far as these people are concerned. The irritating part of this particular argument is well-meaning members of the minority community, people who are educated and people who are leading voices from the minority communities have themselves said, you are walking into the trap of increased minorityism by pushing us into a separate corner as opposed to allowing us to integrate with the mainstream and yet retaining our identity. Performing a social obligation which is applicable to every citizen of the country does not take away my identity as a Muslim or as a Christian or a Buddhist or anybody else. So the surprising part is education, they want to rid it of commercialization at a time when every other field of activity is full of commercialization. But what has happened as a consequence is immense politicization and communalization of education. So if if today Mahamana had to establish a Banaras Hindu university and he had the money to establish this kind of a university, he would have perhaps lesser incentives to establish an institution as opposed to someone who established the Jamia Milia Islamia or somebody who established the Aligarh Muslim University. That is the simple consequence. And while you are looking at this, here is the interesting part. And this is something since it is happening before the Supreme Court, I would like you to know. On an average over the last decade alone, the Indian government has spent close to 7,000 to 10,000 crores each on Aligarh Muslim University as well as Jamia Millia Islamia, which is why these institutions are at liberty to offer their courses at 25 rupees a month, 30 rupees a month because there is a government subsidy which is acting. Despite which, these institutions claim that they are minority institutions which are not central institutions despite them being recognized as institutions of national importance under the constitution. Now look at how this entire thing works. Forget for a moment if there is a political motivation to this argument or there is a religious motivation to this argument. Purely look at it from the standpoint of constitution, facts and logic. If you believe that you are an institution which has the right to protect its identity, is it your argument that your identity is being compromised by you ask, by being uh, asked to perform a social obligation? That's one. Two, why should the government spend 7,000 crores or 10,000 crores in the promotion of any particular religious institution? Because that according to me would also be in violation of secularism. 
if a certain institution is set up for the promotion and advancement of a specific culture, whether it is Hindu, Muslim, Christian or Sikh, doesn't make a difference, then the government must not spend money for the promotion of that particular institution and certainly not spend over and above what it spends on other institutions. This is not logic that flows from any particular ideology. This is plain and simple logic that flows from the fundamental principle of constitutional secularism. If you expect the state to be distant from the church, the temple, the mosque or the Gurdwara, then you must be equally distant or you must be equally close. Okay. Let's have some questions. Yes, sir. I can hear without the mic. I don't know about the audience. Yeah. In the back, they can hear me? Okay, this is better. Carry okay. on, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I just uh, want to educate me further. Uh, what I understood uh, about the, the constitution, because I am not the law student, yes, sir. Uh, that constitution should be logical, okay, yes, sir. and the spirit of constitution should be also looked. So, whatever you have told, I am not uh, completely agreed and can, can, uh, you know, convinced. Okay. Why? Because if we go back to the history like in 2002, the Supreme Court, okay, when uh, ensured that uh, the right to education to everyone till the age of 14, right. and then uh, maybe whatever the time frame, they permitted private entity to make it as a business, okay. When any person come as a business, okay, then it's the spirit of constitutions that person is not doing a charitable activity, right. okay. It's doing something with the interest of making a profit. Right. Okay? And then, you know, as a citizen, we also pay the tax. Okay? By choice or by force, it doesn't matter, we have to pay the tax when we make the money. Same way, if any education institutions created by a private entity with the intuition to make the money, then it's completely fair to impose them that 25% of their profit or the total number of seat should be dedicated to the people who are from the community who cannot afford it. And the cost actually, it's not going to the uh, private entity who is making the institution. That is, is, the cost is going to the rest of the 75% population of that locality who is bearing that cost. So, why we are, you know, imposing this as a private entity is losing it. No, private entity is not losing. The 75% citizens of that particular locality is paying for the rest of the 25% and still the private entity is claiming that 25% money from the government. Right. So there the spirit of constitute is completely violated mm. and I am very to say my, my uh, uh, very wise friend as an as a advocate that that spirit of representing the individuals, okay, and really ensuring that the private entities who is making the business out of it should honestly, sincerely apply the mandatory obligations, which is not okay. Let okay. Me so that's my point because whenever we are representing, we are just representing other side of the story. Then rest of the seventy-five percent people forget what is our right. Because I am paying for the 25 percent people. So then May how to put... Yeah, no. May I answer? No, because... No, no, hold on. The uh, part, which is also very important, uh, there I don't agree. Please. And what you said, it, suppose I am from like say Telangana, what you said. If you go in Telangana, you represent the minority. But what... already insured at the state court are you there also? That part also you can mention. Let me uh, respond to this. Now here is the funny part of your argument. No, no, I am just responding to it because I disagree with the, uh, the so-called logic that you have presented because I believe that it lacks logic. So let me explain why. The person who sets up an institution as an educational institution, is he exempt from paying taxes from the revenues that he actually collects as part of the fees? He's not, right? So what we are saying is, not only are you expected to make a payment by way of a tax to the state from the revenue that you earn from your educational institution, you must also undercut yourself at the second layer by opening 25% of your institution 
as far as the seats are concerned to people who come from a certain background. That's one. That effectively means you are looking at it from the standpoint of a taxpayer. You have not contributed to the establishment of that particular institution. You have not contributed to that particular enterprise. He has earned a certain profit from the enterprise that he has set up. So what is your right in expecting a certain obligation from him? That's one. You can have an obligation from the state because you're paying tax to the state and not to that particular fellow who's established that institution. Your state has failed in its obligation to run institutions of quality and in providing universal education. As a consequence of its failure, it chooses to pass off and push that particular buck onto the private guy. And you want him to be taxed twice, wherein he has to pay from his pocket for the tax from the revenue that he earns, in addition to the 25% that he has to open. Point number two, if this is the logic, what is the logic behind the presumption that only people from the majority community who establish private unaided institutions are actually doing it for profit? So is the profit motive absent completely in those people who establish institutions from the minority communities? In which case, no, no, no. So I have, there are two layers of arguments as far as my argument is concerned. I understand. I am bringing it because that's one of the objects of my talk. I am clearly saying on the aspect of taxation, on the aspect of taxation, no, hold on. You may have trouble and perhaps you have trouble get, getting into the issue of majority versus minority. I leave it to you. You don't have to. I'll get into it. That's okay. The point I'm trying to make is this. The point I'm, to, I'm trying to make is very simple. When a private enterprise chooses to set up a certain institution, he is reaping the benefit of his investment. And therefore, the state absolutely has the power to decide the criteria in terms of quality criteria to ensure that the payment that is made by the student towards the institution is recovered by way of quality education. And that the infrastructure which is promised to that particular institution is delivered to the T. But to say that there must be a second layer of taxation through a 25% cut as far as EWS candidates are concerned, particularly when the state has clearly proven to be incompetent in reimbursing these institutions in most of these places, the state and the center have not been able to work out the formula as a consequence of which private institutions have shut down. Now here's the situation. A parent who wants to ensure that a school is open and is available in his locality is now faced with not a costly option but is faced with zero options as a consequence of the schools being forced to shut down. Therefore, unless and until the state can be trusted, so here's the point. Why should the private party pay for the incompetence, inefficiency and serious lack of execution and implementation on the part of the state? Second, even if the state believes that it has the right to interfere with private education, it has the right to interfere only to the extent of ensuring that the quality criteria are met. Not to say that I have failed to do something, therefore I shall pass it on to you. This is something that I think I have to agree to disagree for the simple reason that we are imposing a neo-socialist kind of approach to say, I am paying a certain tax, therefore you have to pay the money because I have a certain obligation or I have a certain expectation. What is your constitutional right to expect anything from a private party? Answer that question. If you say that you have to trace your rights and your expectations to the constitution, under which provision of the constitution do you have any expectation from a private party? Please. You make a private institution, then you have to follow certain rules and Explain to me why is my obligation also inclusive of 25% of people who come from a certain background. Explain to me why is that. Because you given freedom to increase your fees as much as you want. Only from people who are in a position to pay it. Yes. Am I charging? No, no, here's the point. If you cannot pay a fee, if you cannot pay a fee, you don't have to enter my institution. Second, it is for the government to ensure that people who are not in a position to pay the fees are accommodated in government institutions. How is it that the government has succeeded in doing so? No, please answer this question. No. There are two students. Yes. One is paying higher, right. other is paying lower. Right. And they are getting the same education. Then here again, it will be right and violated. I think you are mixing up issues. In the private institution, why should somebody be allowed to say that I have a right of access to your institution notwithstanding the fact that I don't have the purchasing power to enter that particular institution? Both merit and money matter as far as that particular institution is concerned. You answer the question as to what is your right to enter that particular institution. You are not in a socialist society anymore. So tomorrow you will say, I have a right to enter Max Hospital or a Fortis Hospital or, or the best of hospitals for this thing because as far as I am concerned, you have established a medical institution and therefore there is a social obligation and the social obligation requires you to treat me free of charge. Is that going to be your argument next? No, no. Let's push this argument.
I am not, so I come from a low middle class family myself. I don't come from an elitist family at all. So let me make the point. I am trying to say, assume for a moment that if I, I have a Pushtani Jaidad on the basis of which I have decided to set up my practice, then that's a different issue altogether. I have, I have stood in ration lines as a child. I have stood to, there to buy rice. So I know the pain of, of this entire thing. But therefore, I know for a fact that as someone who for the most part has been self-made, it is difficult for me to say that now that I have done something, I must give something to somebody else. If I do, I do so on the basis of my charitable inclination and not as a consequence of the state imposing an obligation on me. If you, if you normalize this kind of an obligation, where does it stop? The next thing that they'll say is every profession has to do this. Therefore, the state says that I have the paramount duty to educate, I'll delegate that particular duty. How simple and how easy and how thoroughly ridiculous. I, I, the, I'm not someone who's going to say that allow market forces to completely run right to such an extent that education becomes so exorbitant that it, 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 it is at par with, let's say, a five-star hotel. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The no, not at all. The point is to basically say the person who is in a position to pay must also be and he must also be uh, uh, making a reasonable payment. That is different from saying someone who cannot make a payment at all should be accommodated at that particular institution at the expense of everybody else. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul. That makes no sense. Frankly speaking, that would be the definition of what uh, Venezuela effectively followed and now they are eating rabbits. Frankly speaking, if you look at these judgments, you effectively decided to cast these principles in socialist principles at a time when the society has decided to go past socialism. The spirit of the constitution has changed with economics. The spirit of the constitution is not static. If it is an important activity, let the state decide to outlay more budget, allocate more funds to educate more people. That is the simple solution. If you feel that your heart is bleeding, then your bleeding heart should translate to you taking an action and not saying my heart is bleeding, therefore you act. That makes no sense. You have a problem, then you carry the candle to Jantar Mantar. You don't give it to somebody and say you carry it on my behalf. Next. Yes, please. Good question. Very good question. I'll answer the question. If you want to acquire on the grounds of eminent domain, you have to establish at least two or three things. One, that there is an absolute necessity for you to acquire the piece of property because without acquisition of the particular piece of property, a certain objective cannot be achieved. Okay? When you choose to acquire and you apply the doctrine of eminent domain, then that property merges with the state. Right? In which case, even when you apply the test of eminent domain on the basis of which land acquisitions happen, you have to give a certain compensation to the person from whom you acquire land, fair enough. Then you acquire the private institution, make it a state institution, give him the compensation. Ye dong jo kar rahe ho, which is to say, call him a private institution and imposing state obligations on a private institution, don't do that. That would be at loggerheads with the concept of eminent domain. The concept of eminent domain is when that particular piece of property, whether it's private or public, merges with the state. And when it merges with the state, it then effectively becomes the property of the state. Now, here's the thing. But the state is paying the compensation. It must not be a just compensation, but it is paying the compensation, whether it's uh, whether you are example of 200 rupees or not. Now, hold on. You have shifted your goalpost. One. If you have decided to employ the concept of eminent domain, it requires the property to become state property. In this case, it remains a private institution. So for all appearances sake, you want to give the impression that I have autonomy. But my autonomy with respect to the most fundamental aspect of my administration, which is intake, has been interfered with to the extent of ek chathai, which is 25%. That will be a state property. No, no. So here's the point. Prior to the invocation of the doctrine of eminent domain, you have to explain why do you need to invoke the doctrine insofar as I am concerned? What is it that you have not been able to achieve that you want me to achieve on your behalf? The question is, if the government is in a position to spend its own money, here's the thing, you are happy to reimburse me, but you are not happy to spend that own money on your own institutions to improve the quality of your own education. Does it make sense? 
Why do you need to invoke the concept of eminent domain when you have clearly established that you have the resources to reimburse me? If you have the resources to reimburse me, then improve the quality of government education. In America, private school, no, no, hold on. Let me just make this point. Frankly speaking, I am aghast at the mixture of the example. So let me unravel your example for a moment. In most of these jurisdictions which call themselves welfare states, be it France, be it the better part of Europe or America, these people say that private institutions and private schools must be as minimum as possible because the state has taken upon itself the obligation to educate people. In all the judgments that the Supreme Court has cited to justify why education should be free at the primary level, you know what judgments they cite? American judgments. Foreign judgments they cite to justify why universal elementary education must be made compulsory. You have cited the judgment of a foreign jurisdiction. Why don't you follow the principle of the foreign jurisdiction with respect to interference with private rights and private enterprise? You can't pick and choose and say that I will take a few parts and I will ignore the other parts because I think there is a convenient position that I can adopt. When you have decided to cite foreign judgments to say that I want compulsory education and I want mandatory primary education, then ensure that you are in a position to fulfill the duty. Those judgments were not cited in the context of passing the buck onto the private party, but to improve the quality of the state education and to ensure that the state is held accountable by the taxpayer. The funny part is, the taxpayer does not seem to have the guts or the inclination to challenge the state. Instead, he wants the private party to bear the burden of the state. And he's casting his expectations on the state and he's also justifying it. That's the funny part. Right? So, if you really want to apply the concept of eminent domain, the first test is the necessity test. Which means it must be indispensable. Prove your indispensability. In which case, shut down all your government schools. Because what you're running is a sham. And then you cast those obligations and ensure that there is a proper reimbursement criteria and there is a proper reimbursement mechanism for the private parties. You can't run government schools, bleed money on that particular account and also ask the private parties to take off this particular burden. Effectively you have established, why is government school necessary? Because private parties will not have the incentive nor will they have the interest in establishing schools in the remotest parts of the country. Which is why you need the government to continue being the business of education. Simple, I'll give you an example. Malaria is a tropical disease, right? A foreign pharmaceutical company which comes from that part of the world where there is no tropical disease, will it have any investment or an incentive to look into the research for malaria or any tropical disease? It will not. Which is why you need the government to work on those aspects where the private party will have zero incentive to interfere. So how does it typically work in these jurisdictions? Private forces and private enterprise will operate in those domains where there is sufficient incentive for them to recover investment. And when you know for a fact that the private party will not get into the picture at all, the government steps in because it is in public interest to do so, because it has a duty to do so, because it is seen as parents patria, which is the parent of the people. Right? In which case, you improve the quality of your education. This RTE has effectively diverted the attention from the quality of government run schools and has decided to focus this entire issue and recast this issue on how can we impose this obligation on the private party. Now here's the thing, if the government were to improve the quality of its institutions, will other people not have enough incentive to push their children into the government school? Government schools for educated people and well-to-do people have become not the norm but an exception, almost an exception, that too only when it happens to be the Kendriya Vidyalaya and not any other institution, right? So why is there no discussion on this? That means effectively the government has managed to do something that it always succeeds at, which is in creating a diversion. The attention has moved from the quality of government run institutions to what the private party must do. Yes. Uh, the basic question has been arose regarding this. The imposition of Article 21 is regarding the state shall. Right. The state shall provide the PhD for education. Right. Right. Okay. So the, the gist of this question is that. that why the private party, if I am being the individual, why I am being the enforced by the state to get the generation uh, of 25%? Okay, that's the thing. By the, uh, you would have heard what the direct to state policy, right. Yes, right. So, the state is also obliged to impose them and enforce them. So, under Article 1960, you consider that the right to provide education and open administration institutions right. comes under Article 191G. Right. Then, there should also Article 
1906, which provides a Cartesian article 191G right. for the interest of general public and for the enforcement of article 41, 45 and 46. That's my first thing. That is how the private institutions are also included in the ambit of this generation. I hope you are saying this after reading the reference because the reference is the exact opposite citing the very same provisions that you have said and I'll explain why. We we'll finish our question and I'll explain. Okay, as well as the intention was that when you are considering the minority, by the minority being excluded, right. it has been intended by the, all the persons, all the courts as well, that if you use the Rajasthan case, versus you of India, that minority institutions are intended just because to preserve themselves. Right. That's why they are not intended to make any profit. And if they are, they are aided, that's why they fall in the division of the state. And if they are unaided, they are intended that they are just to preserve themselves. Right. Not to make any profit. That's why they are being excluded from the criteria of preservation. So, uh, two responses to that. Yes. Okay. Now, let me just try and explain uh, his question. Uh, for those who may not have understood it. So there are fundamental rights under the constitution and there is something called as directive principles of state policy. Now fundamental rights are those rights which you can assert, enjoy and whose protection you can seek when the state chooses to infringe on those rights. Whereas directive principles of state policy are those principles which come under part 4 of the constitution and which have traditionally been seen as Goals to be reached, but not vestation of rights. This is a future statement of vision. Ki Bharat ek din aisa hoga. Which effectively means that it will be a place where there is more scientific temper, that there is more education, that there is universal education and a host of other things. The Supreme Court has effectively interpreted these two parts of the constitution to basically say, directive principles of state policy represent the goal to be reached using fundamental rights as the means. Which means this is the means to that particular end. Okay. Therefore, it may not always be possible to treat directive principles of state policy as justiciable rights. Which means they cannot be enforced. But whenever the court interprets fundamental rights, it must interpret it in a manner so that it is consistent with the achievement of the directive principles of state policy. That's point number one. Point number two. There are two provisions of the constitution that the court has effectively looked at. Uh, articles 41 and 45. One deals with primary education until the age of 14 and the other deals with education other than primary education because primary education is already covered under article 14. Two provisions cannot be speaking of the same thing. Therefore, the Supreme Court has said that the state has a mandatory obligation to provide compulsory education until the age of 14 to give effect to article 41 which had a time frame of how many years? 10 years from the constitution. When the Supreme Court was looking at this issue, 44 years had passed. Okay. Therefore, the Supreme Court said, now I have no other option but to push the legislature because the legislature does not seem to be acting on this particular issue. But it also gave a caveat, which is right to free education and compulsory education is limited only to primary education until the age of 14, but not beyond that because article 45 says subject to the capacity of the state and the development of the state. Which is why when it comes to professional degrees, engineering, medicine, it is all the more difficult to pass on the state's obligation onto a private party because all these obligations are on the state. So as far as the first issue is concerned, I am very clear that uh, until the age of 14 you are supposed to get it. Now here is the funny part. It does not say 6 to 14. It says until the age of 14. Today education does not start at 5 or 6. It starts with pre-education. Right? RT applies to what age group? 6 to 14. So look at the hypocrisy of the state. You have cited a certain judgment which effectively says until the age of 14 you decide the lower limit yourself. And these judgments have never said involve the private party in the disposal of your obligation or in the discharge of your obligation. It is for you to do so. Why? If you look at all these judgments, what is the court said? In the 50s and the 60s the outlay in the first plan and the second plan for education, primary education was to the tune of 50%, 45%. Third plan it becomes 40%. Next plan it becomes 35%. Then it becomes 30%. That's when the Supreme Court says, Constitution is asking you to increase your expenditure as far as private edu primary education is concerned. And significantly you have reduced your budget as far as this education is concerned. Whereas all of the countries in the region, 
including poorer countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan have only been increasing their budget outlay for primary education. So here's the funny part. Constitution says something, Supreme Court endorses it, 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 it effectively catches you with your pants down as far as the facts are concerned to say, look at you, your figures have gone down. You come out with a breakout strategy which does not involve increasing your budget but to passing on the buck to the private party. Now you see the big picture. So one, to escalate the expectation of free and primary education also to secondary education and tertiary education is to completely erode and dilute the concept and value of secondary education. It is not my case that a poor person should not have access to secondary education or tertiary education. I am saying it must come at the expense of the state and not at the expense of the private party. And the government must at least, here is my point, why don't you provide scholarships for people who study in private education in private sectors or in private institutions? No, no, in which case why do you want this reimbursement? The reimbursement as a concept has failed fundamentally because the state is always cash trapped. It doesn't have enough money to pay these people. But if you were to actually put it as scholarships, what will happen then? Then every person who is entitled to a scholarship will have remedies against the state. Now the schools are standing with their katoras in front of the court. Saying we don't have the money to run these schools anymore. Here's the interesting aspect. On secondary education and on tertiary education, the investment from private parties has increased exponentially, astronomically. But nobody wants to invest in primary education because of the sheer trouble of this. Look, the reason why primary education should not be subjected to this kind of control is it is difficult to compare the situation from one district to another district, from one state to another state, from one village to another village. Therefore, it is extremely contextual. You have not evolved any particular economic criteria to decide how much am I supposed to pay a state government for a particular school in a particular place. It is such a flawed criteria. You have come out with an average. The average is only uh, a misleading representation of the actual cost that you incur. Some may be in 5000, another may be in, uh, in 1000 or 2000 and you pay somebody 2000, somebody is benefiting more than he is supposed to and there is no re uh, repayment mechanism and somebody is benefiting less than he is supposed to. I am not on the principle of universal education. I am for it. I am completely for it. The question is how do you achieve it? Whether it is right for the state to not look at its own conduct and introspect when it comes to its own investment and conveniently pushing it on this side. That's all I am trying to say. Yes. You have a question. Yes, please. Sir, uh, as far as your talk was concerned, you were speaking sometimes logically and sometimes on the basis of constitution. Yes, please. So, I want to ask you a question. I am not a law student, please. So, what are your views on, like, uh, from, uh, if right to equality is mentioned in the constitution, so to say, are you saying that the rights given to women, which constitutes almost 50% of the population, should be wiped out? And why you are quoting just minority institutions? Why not caste institutions, caste based like uh, institutions? Right. Why not them? They are also getting the benefits. Why okay. only minority you are targeting? Wonderful. I'll answer this question. And sir, uh, 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 if uh, I'll be precise, because you have a lot of time. I'm sorry for the words I am using. Sir, if you are having more wisdom to interpret what the constitution is saying, is saying, why are Supreme Court judges over there? Mm. And sir, Good. we have uh, we have seen the outcome of uh, government not regulating uh, coaching institution. What they are right. producing is merely a factory of youth. They, they are like poultry farm, right. of which one or two came out, or and other are like based. Right. And yeah. sir, these are my questions. Okay, so let's. I'll, I'll take the most provocative question and answer it first. Which is, why do we need the existence of a Supreme Court when you know more than the Supreme Court? I'll answer that question, right? Going by that logic, no judgment of the Supreme Court must be open to any kind of criticism because once the Supreme Court says it, it's the last word, right? Or for that matter, any court, any constitutional court, the moment it takes a position on an issue of public interest, you must respect that particular judgment and you must keep your mouth shut and no criticism is warranted. Let me make my point. Going by that logic, nobody should have questioned the logic of the Supreme Court's first verdict uh, uh, in upholding Article Section 377. Okay? That particular verdict was reviewed, 
revisited, reconsidered significantly because of public pressure, because the public decided that the Supreme Court is at loggerheads with both logic and with the times. That's point number one. Point number two, the good part of a democracy is that the Supreme Court's verdict is final only because it happens to be the Supreme Court and not because the Supreme Court is right. And this is something that the Supreme Court itself has said, which is to say, our judgments are not immune from any kind of criticism. Now, since the people who are presiding over the benches of the Supreme Court are also human beings, the assumption goes that goes with it is that since they are human beings, they are also prone to mistakes and errors. So when you challenge the verdict of the Supreme Court, you are not challenging an individual, you are basically challenging the person who is holding that office to say that your own interpretation is inconsistent with both logic as well as with the constitution. Here is the funny part. I will give you a simple example. This is something that anybody can pull out and read. From paragraph 64 onwards, read the judgment of the Supreme Court of 1993 in that Unni Krishnan judgment, which was the major judgment where they said that establishing an educational institution is not a fundamental right. From paragraph 64 onwards, the more you read, you will ask yourself, did they actually say this? They, the Supreme Court says that you have the right to establish an educational institution, but we will not decide under which article of the constitution you have the right. This is the constitutional court, the supreme constitutional court of the country saying that I will not answer the question as to which is the provision I trace your rights to. Okay, so that's point number two. Point number three, I confidently criticize the supreme court in front of the supreme court during the arguments before the supreme court, which I don't have a problem with at all because that is a right that I have as a lawyer and I have as an individual as well. So there's no problem with that. So therefore, if your argument is, do you know better than the supreme court? I might, who knows? It's a question of logic. On a point of law, on a point of logic, if you think you are right, how does it matter if it's the Supreme Court? It is always wrong if you impute personal allegations to that particular institution, but you are entitled to have a professional criticism of that particular judgment without a doubt any day. There is no problem as far as that is concerned. And I will not shy away from the making this statement. You can make this public. I have said this on record. Two. What was your next question? Uh, about, uh, Women. Okay. Please name for me an institution which is established on the basis of a caste and which has been given the minority tag by the National Commission for Minority Educational Institutions which was set up in 2009. So, I am not going to I am not a law student. So, that is why I am trying to say. So, here is the thing. Let me answer this point. So, okay. I am talking as a layman and you have to that like, Don't use layman. It is misogynistic. Say layperson. Okay. You are talking of women. You are talking of women's rights. Say, it, say lay, layperson. Uh, not mankind. It is humankind. Sir, I am just uh, I ah. I understand. I am answering your question now. All I am trying to say is this. See, nothing stops anyone from establishing an institution to protect the rights of their community. I am very clear about that. Proposition 1. Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Vaishnavites, Shaivites, Vishwakarmas, any community has the right to establish an educational institution for the purposes of its community and that is a constitutional right. It is not flowing from Maya Bhayastam. I am saying it comes from the constitution. Okay. My point was very simple. That when you decide to apply a social obligation, apply it equally without discriminating on the basis of caste or religion. If your goal is to ensure that the maximum number of Indian students get educated between the age of 6 and 14, then it makes very little sense to say, that this obligation does not apply to one set of institutions because of their religious identity. That is the simple point I am trying to make. My point is retaining their cultural and religious identity is not at conflict with their obligation to perform a social obligation which everybody else has. Because the, see the state is not saying let's educate Hindus. The state is saying let's educate Indians. If that is the argument then when you enter an educational institution even if you are a minority institution, under this particular subject, you are entering as an Indian, not as a Hindu, not as a Muslim. That's the simple point. Point number three, what is your third question? Why you are targeting minority? No, no, I have answered that. I am not targeting minority. If somebody is getting a special treatment, I will say it aloud. What is wrong with it? It's not targeting. It's saying facts. So, yes. Do you have said national integrity, right. not causing harm to that thing. And okay. Why not? And sir, 
Ah, good, good. Come to the committee. I'm happy to answer the question. Yes. Right. They are preferred over the like. They are not. Why not? They are not included in that. Okay. Now, notwithstanding the fact that your question is not directly related to the topic, I'm happy to answer this question. Okay. Do you want me to answer this question? Yes. Yes. Show of hands. How many people want me to answer this question? Okay. Done. So, if I take time to answer this question, kindly do not see me as running away from answering any other questions. I am the last person to run away from any question. Okay? So, I will answer your question now. Okay? Abolish the caste system because it is in the interest of national integration. Is that your proposition? Fair enough. Have I captured your proposition correctly? No mischief? Right? Okay. Done. I am happy to do so. Will everybody do it? Will people who benefit from the existence of the caste system stop doing it? Answer. Give me an answer because you have to survive in this campus. Go ahead. <laughs> huh. So, and I have said this bluntly in multiple places, that the people who have asked for the abolition of the caste system are the ones who have engendered caste politics across the board. Because they have made it a habit. So when they say abolish the caste system, they've said abolish the identity of certain castes and retain the identity of certain other castes. And in the process what they've done is that they've affected social cohesion. Do it across the board. But here's the problem with it. And I'll say this bluntly myself. I was asked uh, uh, once, what is your position on reservations? I said I support reservations on caste-based system. There's a good reason for it. I will not support the abolition of either the caste system or caste based reservations because it is premature at this point of time, particularly because the caste system has created a certain disparity and the reservation system is meant to try and address that historical disparity and until the disparity is bridged to a significant extent, it is in the benefit of people who want the reservation to go to say abolish the caste system along with the reservation which is given in the caste-based system. And I say this as someone who comes from the much revived Savarna community. Let me be blunt on that. Okay. My point is very simple. Caste-based reservations are meant to ensure that a certain gap which has been created as a consequence of years of practice is addressed. Why? Because you want people to know that you are sorry for what has happened. So, uh, which is the state which is known for its support of slavery in America? So, there are two sides which fought the civil war, the confederacy and the Yankees, Southern right? Sorry? Southern states. Southern states. Virginia, that's the place. The Senate of Virginia comes out with an open resolution apologizing for what it did to the African Americans during the period of slavery. Now, according to me, Apart from saying a sorry, it is not enough to say a sorry because this is, way, this is a certain way of reparation for what you have done. Okay. I am sure you didn't expect this answer from me. I know. That is why I am giving you this answer. And this is not an answer that I have created out of thin air because I have said this on public forum multiple times. Okay. So the answer is, one is on the question of principle, on the question of justice, on the question of social justice. Indian social justice or the Indic way of social justice believes that apart from saying sorry, confession in a closed box is not enough. Karma has to kick in. Therefore, pay for what you have done. That is what we believe in. Okay? Two, frankly, you can do whatever you want. You will never be able to kill the caste system because you have not understood it. You have not understood the creature called caste because you still don't know whether it is Varna, Jati or what is it. Frankly, you don't know. And I mean not you. In general, people have not understood it. Oh, so are you saying that the Supreme Court has not understood it? You understand logic better? You have understood caste system also better? Frankly, even I have not understood it. And I am still trying to read. Today, when you follow the caste system, you are going by the nomenclature used by the Britishman as part of his colonial records where the identity was static. Ek bar lag gaya, to lag gaya wo Whereas the caste identity has been traditionally fluid. It has not been static. It started off as a fluid identity, went through a situation where it became so rigid that you cannot move. And then that movement was further curtailed by calling it under the brand of caste. 
and then giving it as part of a certificate. I'll give you a simple example. It was a fantastic example. There is a community, Devendra Vellalar community from uh, Tamil Nadu. They want themselves to be removed from the category of SEs. They said we don't want to be under that particular category. We are perfectly comfortable fighting in the general category. The day that happens, two things will happen. And this is where most educated minds today will not be able to reconcile. Reservation will die a natural death, but caste system will continue to be alive for the simple reason that you fail to understand the sheer cultural value and the intrinsic identity that every person from every caste enjoys. From the top to bottom, if at all there exists any, according to me, it's a horizontal structure. It was never meant to be a vertical structure. It was never meant to be a hierarchical structure. So if you actually do this, you are telling someone that you are at the bottom of the ladder when he is saying, don't tell me I am at the bottom of the ladder, I am at a certain place of the ladder, I will decide where I am, you will not decide for me. Okay. People who want the abolition of the caste system are the ones who will never let anyone move out from that particular caste identity because they want that particular caste identity so that they have something to talk about. So that they have something to show and point fingers at to say, as long as this particular structure is alive, I got a fantastic whipping boy as far as the Hindu identity is concerned. Therefore, read more about the caste system and ask yourself if the word caste does justice to that particular concept, to that particular system. Don't read a Wendy Doniger. Read an R.C. Majumdar. Read Indian authors on this particular point. Understand more about this. In fact, in engineering campuses and medical campuses is where this discussion must start. Unfortunately, that's the place where it will not start. Because there it will start with allegations, not with facts or logic. For people who are being trained in professional degrees which are drenched and dyed in logic, this is the last place where logic will be applied. You will not touch it at all. Because you have not done enough reading. Your sources of information are what? Barkhadat, NDTV, India Today, who else? What books have you read on this particular issue? From this end to that end, opposing points of view. Have you read Deepankar Gupta? Have you read a Conrad Elst? Have you read a Michel Danino? Have you read a Sitaram Goel? Have you read a Dharampal? Have you read a Ram Swaroop? These are all people who have written so much on this. I will give you a simple thing. Uh, I love Hindi as a language. I am breaking a few more myths here, notwithstanding my complexion. So wait and watch. So there is a beautiful book called Sanskriti Ke Char Adhyay. Written by Ram Dhari Singh Dinkar who was known as a nationalist poet in the 1950s. Read his book on what he believes is the journey that the Indian civilization has traversed and what is it the culture that you see today is a product of. He traces it uh, across four epochs. He looks at uh, migration from Africa. He looks at migration from other parts and he still doesn't call it an invasion theory. He calls it a migration theory. Those who want to create trouble in this country will continue to call it an invasion theory. If at all it has any basis. Rakhi Gadi is saying something else. That's a different issue. But the point is, all of this is intrinsically connected to the so-called Aryan invasion theory translating to the Jati system or the Varna system or the caste system. Read that and read the politics surrounding that and the amount of mischief that this particular country has been subjected to will become crystal clear to you. You don't need to buy my word for it. You just see the opposing points of view. One is saying we are all one, the other is saying you are all different and you need to be fighting with each other. Somebody who fights against the Supreme Court, does he think he's better than the Supreme Court? Hey, what's happening? I understand. 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 I American countries they have See, frankly, for a moment, let us uh, what I will suggest is for good or bad, maybe it is not right to compare India with America. Three times the size, one third the population, as far as America is concerned. It's what 330 million as a population and 96 uh, lakh square kilometers. Perhaps only after China or Canada, whichever the way you see, you know, however you calculate the territory. India, what? It's one third the size. If you compare the next biggest country after us, I think that's Australia. 
that's about 72, how 72 lakh square kilometers and after that is Brazil which is at 85 lakh square kilometers, this is the comparison and look at the sheer population that we have managed to cram in this place. So, on that basis alone perhaps comparisons may not be justified. What I would actually request is India must evolve its own concept of rights and duties based on its own circumstances. Don't copy someone because it makes for an easy cut based on when you write a judgment. Evolve your own original thought process in terms of what, whether this is wrong for me or this right thing is not the way to look at it. What is the problem? What is the solution? Is this the best you can do to address the problem, regardless of which side the solution comes from? That's as simple as that. The moment you start doing it, better answers will come. Because you are not bound by your so called vichar dhara and your ideology, you are not stuck in those bloody boxes. Part of my language. And it doesn't come from your point of view. Even a bad clock manages to show the right time twice a day. So somebody is capable of being right at least once in a while. So when it comes to uh, the Indian discourse, typically, it has always been a duty based discourse. It has not been a rights based discourse. Kemira Haq and Kemira Adhikara is different. We have always asked ourselves what is your duty as part of the society? That is how you have driven yourself. I am not saying therefore forego the concept of rights. But duty, according to me today, has become a secondary construct to right. That's one. Second, you have become so dependent on the state that this Maipak mentality has been drilled in you for close to 60 years thanks to the product of socialism and Nehruvian socialism. I call it Nehruvian socialism because centralized planning was his baby. And we have every right to criticize him for his policies. Nobody is sacred. If Ram can be criticized, why not Nehru? So, I am saying that as far as we are concerned, our expectations from the state continue to be the same socialist expectations. While the society we live in is effectively moving towards more market force based society, there is a serious conflict. The state has a certain role and that role is limited to providing conducive conditions for individual enterprise and a level playing field as much as possible and to ensure that capitalistic greed does not overpower society's interest and you don't end up creating a communist state as well where there is no room for individual creativity. You have to take up something which is slightly in the middle and as opposed to putting yourself in these boxes, you ask yourself. There was a time when the British entered this country, we had close to 6,35,000 Gurukuls. What happened to all those Gurukuls? There was a time when it was possible for you to look at education from the standpoint of truly a charitable enterprise. But if you have systematically killed the supply side because of racial theories, then there is no question of establishing a Gurukul because you have antagonized and stigmatized that entire group. And you have given it a racial casteist basis. That's the end of the matter as far as I am concerned. Today, teachers are almost being treated like insurance agents. They have to go in summer vacation looking for students for the next set of recruits. That's how terrible it is. I know this for a fact. So you have reduced education to this kind of service as opposed to the original meaning of service. As opposed to service to humanity, it has become a service based enterprise. Therefore, the other person is either a client or a customer, not a student. For you to change these basic expectations, first know what is the role of the state, what you can expect from the state and try to take as much responsibility as possible through private enterprise to address your immediate needs. The state is expected to create conditions which are conducive for the setting up of educational systems and educational establishments, not to create educational institutions itself. It must do so for sensitive areas, so for instance atomic energy, tertiary science, particularly when it comes to cancer research or diseases which are peculiar to this part of the world, which nobody else is willing to invest in. But therefore, it, it calls for reinterpretation of the role of the state. That's the case, then RTE should be abolished then? I still believe that RTE is not meant to be abolished in entirety. It can still be tweaked to achieve the right goals in the right manner, which is quality-based outcomes. Not to say that I will now impose my obligations on somebody else. Ensure that some student, if he pays 5 lakhs or 6 lakhs for a certain course a year, then he gets his worth or his, his money's worth. 
What is the goal? Thank you very much. I am sure the audience would agree with me when I say that it was organic sheer, organic intellect on display. No comment was meant to hurt anyone individually. Okay? This is basically targeting a certain idea or a certain point of view. I am addressing an idea. So kindly don't take it personal. Okay? I am sure there are a lot of other questions, hands rising up to us because of paucity of time we have to bring this discussion to an end. But I am sure Mr. Deepak is available when we for interaction outside for a few minutes. Those of you who still want to have some questions to, uh, to be clarified. I am sure you will also understand why when he was given few minutes of time to present his case before the judge and the judge ended up listening to him for hours together. You can, you can understand the reason. Why? Because it is his sheer intellect which, uh, which when put in the right display knows no bound. There is no particular time foundation for it and today we have been witness for the, for the same. So with these few words, I thank you once again for having taken time from his busy schedule. It's a weekday. To have come here all the way from Delhi to Varanasi to address us. I thank uh, each one of you for your patience listening. May I now request our colleague Pro Prakash to come and felicitate the uh, guest with a memento. Thank you once again for your patience to listening and let's give our speaker a final round of applause. <laughs> so this is the, 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 the program to a close. Thank you very much.